Welcome to another uh, three, two, one. Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode seven hundred and five. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is December ninth, twenty twenty one. All right, due to the benefits of Kevin not doing all the audio checks, you're going to be watching Monday or Tuesday's program today. Good for you. No, Kevin forgot to check the audio. The last recording we had, we had to re-record. This is that re-recording right now because it was just not intelligible. Sorry about that. It'll still be a good show, right, George? Oh, it'll be wonderful. We got the same topics, a couple extra topics. We'll be talking about South Carolina and some uh, sensible gun control in today's show. So it'll be a lot of fun. Uh, you, and this is actually a long time ago because it was the weekend, went to Kentucky. What happened there? Went to a wedding up in uh, Crofton, uh, Hopkinsville, Kentucky. Mm -hmm. uh, the wedding itself was in a barn in Crofton, Kentucky. And this was the fanciest barn I've ever been in with uh, bathrooms and no bales of hay. Uh, it was turned into a conference center on the side of a hill. Beautiful place. Mm. My daughter was the maid of honor at the wedding, her roommate from college. And we were, uh, because we were out of town guests, uh, most of the people were from the area. Uh, we were seated and we took, we drove 12 hours to get up there. They seated us at the aunts and uncles table uh of the uh of the groom and susan has to come away from sitting next to uncle fred or whoever he was with the worst cold she's had in her life uncle eddie me, <laughs> uncle eddie me i feel great i'm wonderful susan has been ever since we got home it's a 12-hour drive she has been lying in bed moaning and sneezing and coughing and hacking and not able to sleep and sweating and hold on me, a second that those are COVID symptoms, George. You brought COVID I, home I, from Kentucky, if I'm if I'm interpreting this correctly. Well, uh, I actually bought an at-home COVID test kit uh, to see uh, because that was in the back of my mind. Sure, uh, but the uh, but evidently you need to have a, a, a there needs to be sort of a waiting period from yeah. full-blown COVID. You need to wait a few days, so I'll test her. Um, I actually think I may have had COVID sometime early on because mm -hmm. I had a really bad uh, flu last year, uh, early on in the in the uh, in the epidemic. Pa uh, pandemic, but, yeah. Pandemic. <laughs> so we'll see, uh, but maybe it's maybe it's a coincidence that I'm doing three funerals in the next week mm -hmm. I wonder if there's anything, yeah. well I mean this is that that scary time where I remember when the pandemic first hit and the it's allergy season you get your first cough <coughs> oh no I got it you know it's like it's all over you're writing your will you're calling mom mom I got it <laughs> oh you're just being a little bit right no no I think I got it and now we come home with the flu, the cold, we, whatever. I don't care if I got it. I hope it's Delta. You know, just, just a new mindset now with COVID. Well, one of the neat little things was that the, the father of the groom, who I'd not met before, actually is a Republican congressman from Kentucky. Hmm. And he is on the House uh, Health Committee where that's been uh, addressing COVID and everything. So what did he and I talk about uh, towards the end of the evening where the old people are sitting around waiting, thinking, when can these kids finish? We want to go home. Uh, we talked about the economy. And uh, friends, I am not optimistic because uh, my new friend, a Kentucky Republican congressman, told me that the Republicans are hell-bent on revenge and the Democrats are hell-bent on uh, getting as much as they can while they, while they can. And nobody's looking at the big picture of the economy, of spending, of inflation. Everybody's focused on short-term political games. No, it's and that's true. If you look at the stock market, it's what, like watching an EKG strip up and down, or is you know reacting to COVID, reacting to inflation, reacting to this, reacting to you know borders opening and closing, and nobody's keeping their eye on the ball. Which right now, it's the economy, stupid. You know, I hate to repeat something from the the Clinton administration, but 
um, if you don't keep your eye on this, it's going to hurt not just this nation, but the world even worse because inflation, unlike the 1920s and 30s, which was very insular here to America, anything happening here in America is global. And uh, politics is local, economics is global. I, I'm not. I'm not saying that this particular congressman is just oblivious and only wants his revenge. But he's saying that the way the system is working, by being in the minority, the only thing the Republicans can do right now is try to lay little traps and complain, because they are on. Because he has tremendous fears for inflation and the deficit and devaluation of the dollar. And there's nothing he can do about it. He can do as much about it as you, as you or I can because the positions are so polarized. They're no more what they used to call yellow dog Democrats and uh, Rockefeller Republicans. No. Conservative Democrats and liberal Republicans. They're, those guys are all gone. And so everybody is uh, firmly in one camp or the other and they follow the leader. Yeah, it's a, and we, we're seeing this, you know, certainly with the. Uh, the Supreme Court, the U.S. Supreme Court, and uh, the latest uh, abortion cases to go before them. So uh, it's a very polarized country, and it's interesting to talk to the middleman, the the, the flyover uh, person. Uh, they said, "Yeah, we we kind of support abortion, but we don't really care for you know uh, abortion on demand." What? <laughs> You know, according to the USA Today, the whole world is going to collapse over the the, the future decision by the U.S. Uh, Supreme Court. Nah, duh, you know, it, Joe Mo doesn't care. Yeah, whatever. Not a big deal. Doesn't affect me. I just don't want to pay 45 bucks to fill up my 10-gallon tank. That's all. So, economy. George, let's find a good news story. What, what do we got here? Hmm. Uh, well, we have a good news story that's also a bad news story, and it plays straight into the Anglican wards. Dot Church in Japan has elected its first woman bishop. For supporters of women's ordination, this is a wonderful event, and the reason why is not just because it's another woman bishop. Japan is a very I would, patriarchal oriented, male oriented society. Japan is, does not have women leaders in business or politics or medicine the way the West does. And for a Japanese woman priest to be elected, uh, her name is uh, uh, Mary Grace, uh, let's see, Mary Grace, let me pull it up. I should pull it up too. Uh, Mary Grace Tazu Sasamori. Mary, and Mary Grace is her Christian name. Her first name in Japan, Japanese is Tazu and her last name is Sasamori. She was elected Bishop of Hokkaido, which is the Northern Island. And so this is seen in Asian circles as being a tremendous both cultural shift as well as religious shift. Um, the uh, She's the first East Asian woman bishop. She's the second Asian woman bishop. 2013, uh, 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 woman bishop was consecrated in South India. Now, the other sort of bit of good news is that the person whom she defeated in the election was a priest of the Anglican Church of Korea who's been serving in Japan. Now, Koreans and Japanese do not get along whatsoever. And there's still the hard feelings of the war and the imperial era are still present in Japan and Korea. And to think that a woman and a Korean man were the top runners in a diocesan election in a conservative diocese, Hokkaido, um, does tell you that Japan is changing culture. Well, I don't know if it, Japan is. Certainly the church is in Japan. But uh, I know and I've read stories about female innovators and entrepreneurs from Japan had to move to other countries here in America and, and Europe to have their businesses be successful because within Japan, male dominated businesses would not uh, use her as a vendor. Mm -hmm. And so I do see changes in the church, which is awesome. Um, but I don't know if I see that um, in, in the economically developed part of Japan. Uh -oh. Our, uh, <laughs> I'm going to unplug the phone. It I'm could sorry. be the bishop. <laughs> No, that's a flash. We each of us have a flashing red phone in our desk. That's the bishop's hotline. 
<laughs> the uh, our friends who, of this show who watch from Japan tell us that Christian evangelization in Japan is remarkably difficult. It's not because there's overt hostility, as you find in Muslim nations or in communist authoritarian nations. There's just an indifference to religion in general mm. in the Japanese culture. And our, our Japanese missionary friends tell us that Japan is in such desperate need for uh, the, the good news of Jesus Christ, for its culture and society and for the individuals because Japan in our uh, previous show, which uh, we had to leave in the cutting room floor, you talked about the rate of suicide in Japan yeah, and yeah, the, yeah. the focus of life is work. <laughs> There's no uh, no sense of individual, not, not the Western sense that we have of individual autonomy in relationship with God. Uh, now, the Japanese may look down on that as being too Western, but uh, the Japanese culture really could use a, a shot of Jesus Christ. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, well, just their history of religion and how it went so bad when the emperor over there was their god. Um, you know, to some extent. You know, Japanese, J Japanese, so Japan as a nation, uh, as an island, needs our prayer and certainly our e evangelist. Let's see what we got so, here. Uh, so this is a good news story for supporters of women bishops. It's a yeah. bad news story for opponents of women bishops. So we were able to help both sides. Yeah, one half and half of the other. Uh, let's see here. You mentioned in the pre-show that the bishop is coming to visit. Yes, uh, Greg Brewer, our bishop, is coming uh, this weekend. And it hasn't been here in about four or five years because of COVID. And so we have a number of people to be confirmed and baptized. And just been finishing up uh, the adult in-person confirmation classes and the children's confirmation classes. And I've been recording little videos for the people who are still afraid to come because of COVID. And we have a number of those. Yeah. And I'm, I'm just wondering how a bishop's visitation is going to feel. It's going to work the same way. We have the same schedule and agenda. But the bishop sent me a little note saying he's only going to come to two of the services uh, one of the service not all of the services that we have and he's uh going to be masked and gloved at the service and at the reception afterward masked at the rece reception afterwards and ours is more i guess you would say a touchy-feely congregation we like to socialize we like to get close to other people and talk and see the bishop eat the scallop potatoes and tuna noodle casserole that the ladies guild has made how What's it going to feel like to have confirmation, visitation, uh, pastoral, uh, the bishop exercising his pastoral ministry in a time of COVID? That's going to be new for us. Yeah, it's it's going to be strange, obviously, because you know the Episcopal Church, the Anglican Church, uh, most churches took the whole year off as far as bishop and, and uh, Episcopal visitation. How do you get re into that without... Uh, going back to your diocesan office worried about did you catch COVID and I, I don't have a problem with them being a little overcautious in this time because it's the same reason you know if uh, Secretary Harriet got it and she gave it to you I don't want you spreading it around my church either you know it's just one of those times where uh, I, if you want to be extra extra cautionary fine you know but I think here, here's here's the problem for me. I, you, your your advice is prudent. I mean, we don't wish to infect and harm people mm -hmm. through the spreading of this of a of an illness, a disease. But at the same time, being a Christian is a communal activity. Uh, we reinforce each other's faith. Mm -hmm. We uh, uphold each other in our Christian walk. We, it's very. I don't think it's very productive to be a Christian by yourself. And COVID has forced us to go by ourselves. Now, some churches have taken this far, far beyond any sense of reason. And I'm thinking specifically of the Church of England lockdowns and shutdowns, where Justin Welby and the bishops refused to allow even priests to go into a church to film a service to be broadcast to the congregation. But I think the church, the church did not show itself in, as being an essential service, if you will, which I believe it is. Um, 
And now, after the sort of main ways have gone, we have Justin Welby sort of flopping on the other bandwagon. Uh, England has put a ban on people from Nigeria and South Africa due to the new Omicron variant. And Justin Welby is saying that this is uh, a form of uh, prejudice against people from Africa, not allowing them to come to England. So you had Justin Welby shutting the churches, and now you have him allowing people from the newest uh, it, 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 there's no consistency in his no. message uh, no. other than political correctness <laughs> yeah. if you will. He, he's a very pc abc no no question about it um but we're in that reality now that for all intents and purposes we're post-covid you know the that mean deadly part of covid um it, it, it's kind of dwindling down if you watch the charts you, you see this this constant line going down oh delta okay you had a little delta omicron nobody's dying from uh, omicron you know and so we're to this point now where jp morgan uh, chase and all those places are saying you know 2022 is going to be pretty cool because we can have a recovery and the the economy should pretty much be recovered by second quarter of next year and that's just the outlook now you know the the fear that wall street has of covid and the pandemic is is largely over except when the newspapers and the mass media can really get get one in there omicron oh we need delta cron that would be a scary one delta cron deadlier than covid so we're just to this point now where uh i see the light at the end of the tunnel now you and i talked in march about it being post-covid this is post-covid you know because uh, nobody's dying from Om omicron well <clears throat> i perhaps i still have my head stuck in the confirmation classes i've uh, been leading hmm? uh one of the did the past i record i'm doing them in person and then i recorded uh my scripts if you will uh so that those who are unable to make the class could listen or watch the video of my little presentation. And I recently did the, the pastoral sacraments. Uh, in fact, I did that last night. And you know, we have seven sacraments, five dominical, uh, seven dominical, uh, two, dominical two dominical, five pastoral. Exactly. <laughs> uh, and, when, and I was talking about ordination. And, and I, part, the talk was about what are the different gifts and ministries of a bishop, of a priest, of a deacon. And I'm looking at what the expectations are of a bishop and of a priest and of a deacon in this time. And deacons, by and large, have continued their services. They have not really been hurt. Priests, by and large, have continued their services. It's the bishops whose work really has been most impacted because they don't really have interaction with the faithful and because of that they're able to take these sort of abstract decisions that do that they see are good for the whole but harm individuals in their christian walk yeah I'm specifically yeah. thinking about these mandatory shutdowns and lockdowns well i'm out, i'm also thinking about the interaction you know we are to approach touch love the leper and in my worldview, uh, the people who are unvaxxed uh, have become, not, not through my thinking, but have become the lepers of the society. And we should not have fear in interacting with people who've been unvaxxed. Um, we should not have fear of people who've had COVID. Um, we, we need to get rid of that mentality. We have to have the Christian good neighbor mentality. My, I have actually worked harder during the COVID vaccine that I did before because of the intensification of the pastoral responsibilities I had mm -hmm. of reaching out to people by telephone, by writing uh, notes, and basically trying to keep my awareness of each person's status. And we're not seeing that, and I'm speaking my own experience and also the experience of many other priests across the Anglican Communion, seldom do we have a bishop pastor his clergy the way a pastor is expected to shepherd his congregation and i think that's one of the failings that we have in anglicanism right now of bishops as managers not as uh, guides and leaders and shepherds and fathers and god that's because there's been a big change in the church in the last 50 years 
we are no longer making Christians, George, we're identifying victims. And I, I want to talk a little bit about the, the primates communique that came out. And I think we need to now look at communiques and stuff that come from our national churches through the justice filter. Is this about growing the kingdom? Is this about reaching uh, the lost for Christ? Or is this about trying to find victims and letting them know that they're victims and helping victims? And so um, let's talk a little bit about the primates communicate, George. Well, the primates, I'm going to try to pull it here. Primates mm -hmm. met online November 22nd and 23rd. And this past week, they uh, released the communique from the meeting. Um, and essentially, the communique touched on various uh, hot button issues, uh, COVID, climate change, and things of that nature. And what was so very, for me, depressing was those who have criticized the approach I have that go to Lambeth 2022, take control, fight the good fight and win, those who have criticized that by saying, well, the institution will always prevail in the end. If the, if the, if the primates meeting is any indication, then they're right. If the primates have, communique is, yeah, it, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. We had a primates communique that was written in Marxist social justice language. We talk about climate justice. Words, you know, Christian concepts and understand things like Christian charity, Christian love, forbearance, patience, words of Jesus, the Sermon of the Mountain, things like that. They're missing from the primates teachings on the climate and on COVID. Instead, it's, it's using language and vocabulary that's interchangeable with UN special commissions and government agencies. Um, what's happened uh, once again is the primates' voices and intent is being hijacked by a small group within who do the writing of the communiques and their staff. Um, and in essence, well, for instance, Justin Badi Arama, Archbishop of South Sudan, is quoted saying, We've had terrible flooding in South Sudan, and and yes, they have, but that is taken and manipulated as a voice in favor of this specific UN document in, on climate change and control. Um, now, the church is always about 10 years behind the curve on things, and one of the things that has come out most recently in the wake of this uh, Glasgow climate conference is that CO2 levels have been flat for 10 years. And the rate of growth of temperature, according to a Yale economist who won a Nobel Prize for this topic uh, 90, a few years ago, is that the old fear if we rise six degrees will cause the ice caps to melt, the world will end. That's not gonna happen. It may rise about two degrees. If that happens, the world will bloom because formerly desert areas will become become habitable. Formerly northern areas that were unable to sustain crops will now become irritable. The earth will enter a better phase. The climate's always changing up and down, and a warming to a certain degree would be beneficial. Just as in the early Middle Ages, England was warm enough to have wine production in the south. Um, that was a golden time. Then we had the ice ages come, a uh, mini ice age in the middle of the year, uh, middle ages, and it got cold and dark and rainy. I, so, <laughs> I, it, it is clear if you if you read the, the global climate debate or watch it on social media, there's people who are hiding their knowledge of history or are just not aware of history as far as uh, what we've seen glacier-wise mini ice age wise um the massive heat waves we had in the 1930s uh mid 30s um where did that all come from before we had the great industrial complex that's making uh so many carbons now but this show we we have to keep it short because we have so many topics uh it can't just be about the climate debate but i i want us to realize the church has gone from a church where we're making and when he knew souls to Christ, to were identifying victims and helping them become louder victims. That's not the role of the gospel. The role of the gospel is to change lives. You are a new creation. All things are behind you, gone. 
awful. Boof, boof. You know, and that you can't be a victim and be a Christian, according to the New Testament. Mm. You, you can't. So I'm in trouble again. Whatever. So let's go on here and go back to my show notes. And let's see. Uh, Primate Communique. Oh, we wanted to talk about the anti-Semitism that was found um, more recently. We, we've seen it for the last three or four general conventions, but now I'm seeing it at the diocesan level. Um, diocese of Vermont and Diocese of Chicago are kind of on this uh, pro-Palestinian, uh, pro-Hamas rant uh, against Israel, and I think we need to talk about it. Yeah, they, uh, last month the, di the Diocese of Convention Episcopal Church in Vermont, and this month the Diocese of Convention of the Episcopal Church in Chicago passed very strong resolutions condemning Israel as an apartheid state. This is all part the, the, of... Uh, okay, explain apartheid. That's a bigger word than people know. Apartheid is was the system in South Africa under minority rule where the races were basically had different levels of political and economic rights and if you, you know it's sort of the the whites and asians and coloreds than the local africans uh whites sort of had the power and the africans had no power and white you know people were kept out of jobs out of education not allowed to live in certain places so on and so forth the, and these two dioceses accuse Israel of practicing a form of apartheid against its Arab uh, minority population. Now, that's demonstrably untrue. I mean, there are Arab members of the Supreme Court, Arab ambassadors. Arab Israel. neighborhoods everywhere <laughs> within and, Israel. And when they were talking about re redistricting and, you know, like this Arab village, does it want to be in Palestine or in Israel? 90% of the people there, we want to be Israelis, Arab Israelis. We don't want to be Palestinians. Mm -hmm. because Pal the Palestine Authority is a joke. Well, there's a con concerted worldwide campaign uh, being ma managed by the left in concert with militant Islam to demonize Israel, to basically uh, make Israel and the Jew the... Uh, the Satan in this world today. And this is the line that uh, Ilan Omar, the congresswoman from Minnesota takes, uh, congresswoman Tlaib from Detroit, uh, the hard left views. And Vermont and Chicago ha are some of the more hard left Episcopal dioceses. And they didn't do anything that you don't see in the United Church of Christ and the Presbyterians and you know the Methodists, some of the hard left religious groups we're all pushing the same line. And for me, it's just so depressing to see this Jew hatred uh, clothed in the language of uh, boycott, disinvest, and sanctions um, being promulgated by an extensive Christian body. I mean, they, they it's all lies that they tell. And that's- the state of affairs in Israel. Having watched this, you know, occur for thousands of years now uh, in the Middle East, it, it's beyond the realm of oh, can't we all get along? I mean, this is into the realm of spiritual war. This is where the, the lies that are being told and repropagated um, can only be understood as being a spiritual war. Uh, to, to hate God's chosen people this much for no reason, when evidence is given to you that no, they are not. Uh, modern day apartheid, that there are many Arabs that live in the neighborhoods around uh, Israel and Jerusalem and whatnot, and they participate in all forms of uh, government and commerce in Israel. Why are you saying this? Well, you're saying this because there is a uh, there is a conflict that's being made worse by people who will not, in the end, uh, allow for Israel to exist. And that's yeah. Humas and the, the PLO. Yeah, I mean, we had an item on Anglican Inc. Uh, where two uh, Jewish uh, Christian Anglicans wrote, uh, who are evangelicals, wrote about their struggles uh, to have the Church of England's evangelical wing distance itself from Hamas. Now, you would think that we're going to ask the Church of England to distance itself from the Nazi party and from Stalinism. and. 
the you know Stephen Sizer, former rector of Virginia Water uh, in England, who was very active in evangelical affairs, is an anti-Semite who has been peddling anti-Semitic tropes for years, and he's been disciplined by the Church of England, and it's just been well. There's a whole history you should read on Anglican Inc. Well, uh, these two Jewish Christians uh, said to the head of the uh, Southeastern Evangelical Association, regional grouping in England, are you going to do something about this guy who's leading this group, who's spouting these pro-Hamas, anti-Semitic uh, teachings? And the answer was, no, we can't be bothered. Uh, William Taylor, uh, head of uh, St. Helens Bishop Gate, who was the head of this group, wouldn't uh, wouldn't be, wouldn't respond to their concerns about the acceptance of anti-Semitism in common church life. I mean, it's just so when you can't when people don't see that anti-Semitism is that's the uh, canary in the coal mine. I mean, they always come for the Jews first, mm -hmm. and with, with they're coming for the Jews again. You see this in Europe. You see this throughout the world. Um, you see this from the nut jobs in the United States. Uh, and we need to, I think we need to repudiate this as clearly as possible. Yeah, it, it's amazing to see how it's coming back and there doesn't seem to be any dam to stop it. Uh, we, we're 75 years away from the worst of it uh, happening in not, Europe. Yeah. This does not mean that we approve of everything Israel's ever done or ever yeah. will do. It, it, from it. Is there Israel racism? Absolutely. It, has the nation done stupid things uh, to itself and to its neighbors? Absolutely. Has Israel fulfilled its call? God said, I will bless you to be a blessing. Did they fulfill that? Not really. They're still working on it. It's a work in progress. Um, however... We, that doesn't mean we can, uh, you know, be anti-Semitical to th that nation in any way, shape, or form. Yeah, it's it's a difficult time. Yeah, it's crazy. Oh, but and for a lack of a better word, we just talked about Justin Welby uh, and the Church of England here. Uh, there are things out there that trigger Justin Welby. I thought we could talk about a tweet in response to a, a U.S. Republican uh, pro-gun congressman where he put his family in a picture with a, uh, um, AR rifles. And I thought, oh, that's, that's cute. Someone's going to say something. <laughs> and Justin Welby couldn't wait. So what's this story, well, George? Well, a Kentucky congressman. Not the congressman <laughs> I, I spent Saturday evening with. Uh, but Thomas Massey, a Republican congressman uh, from the state of Kentucky, uh, tweeted out a uh, Twitter Christmas card where he had his family and they're all standing before a Christmas tree uh, holding uh, rifles and the the caption is Merry Christmas PS Santa please bring ammo and a little present box and in an American context we all know exactly what this means this is a, a gun guy who loves his guns and it's a symbol of freedom well Justin Welby responds now, why Justin Welby is getting himself involved at this level of American politics is beyond me. But Justin Welby has to tweet and get into the mud and wrestle with this Republican congressman. And Justin Welby writes, this weekend, many of us were sickened to see a Christmas photo of a family posing with guns. The message of the angels of Christmas is peace on earth and goodwill to all people. It has nothing to do with US gun rights. Let us turn away from the glorification of violence and instead welcome the God who comes to us in peace. And then he goes on, Pope Francis meeting refugees in Lesbos this weekend offers us a truly Christ-like image. Justin, Justin, <laughs> Justin, you are a halfwit. Come on, man. You just don't have a clue. Keep your mouth shut when you don't know what you're talking about. Glorification of violence? This is not what this was about. Mm -hmm. This mm -hmm. was trolling the left this was trying to up yeah well hold on if this was trolling the left and justin uh, welby responded as he did the trolling worked it okay. worked <laughs> but come on yeah you, know, you would hope that this guy who is supposedly the mm. spiritual leader of the anglican communion would have more sense mm. than to be such an idiot 
I mean, know. why why wrestle with why wrestle with? Uh, <laughs> Hold on, it's people like Justin Lobby who make this show viable. If there weren't Justin Lobby's and Rowan Williams and Michael Curry's and Catherine Jefford Shorey's, people would have nothing to watch on Anglican Unscripted. So I appreciate him responding to a troll. Uh, Justin Lobby, you have been trolled. Um, let, well, uh, there's another thing that uh, hmm? on guns from the Episcopal world that is, is more understandable, but still just as silly. Uh, there was a terrible school shooting in Oxford, Michigan last mm -hmm. week. 15 year old boy shot a number of classmates well and it's bonnie perry the bishop of michigan responded to this incident with a pastoral letter to her diocese that makes a plea for quote sensible gun control and her understanding of sensible gun control is confiscation of all weapons that she doesn't like and uh, scares her and that the state has the ultimate uh it's all power and all all rights emanate from the state and the state can give guns the state can take it away from guns and therefore because of her fear we should uh well hold on uh, we, we currently have sensible gun laws we've had them for dozens of years uh, around the different states here in america um connecticut where i was formerly a resident had the strictest gun laws in the nation bar none and they had the waiting period laws. They had the, uh, you had to go through just hooks and ringers to get a gun. And the Connecticut still produced Adam Lanza, uh, who broke all the sensible gun laws. His mom bought a gun and she locked it in a safe. Adam Lanza killed her to get that gun and took that gun to Sandy Hook School and shot these students, which is against the law. We have sensible gun laws. We also have evil people. If we could start taking care of the evil people in the world a little better, a little more sturgent, maybe we would have less reason to go and attack guns and gun laws, which are sensible, in my humble opinion. Ah, George, such strange news we have to talk about. Um, oh, strange news. Let's talk about Jane Ozan and hate prayer. Um, and Canada just passed a law yesterday that says you cannot have conversion therapy or pray for conversion therapy because it is a ghastly, despicable act. So we should probably talk about this because it involves the Anglican communion. George, what did Jane Ozan say? And who is she for our new viewers? She's an ex-evangelical who's active in the hierarchy of the Church of England on the Arch had been on the Archbishop's Council. She changed sides a number of years ago and came out as a lesbian and has been a bit of a harridan, a bit of a histrionic person. If you ever need an over-the-top theological comment, you go to Jane Ozan. She, uh, the Britain is going through this, uh, uh, going through the the witch finding of uh, uh, trying to find the you know evil people who uh, want to uh, convert homosexuals and they want to criminalize that. Well, Jane Ozan says that has been supporting the government's efforts, saying that we need to criminalize hate prayer. If someone comes to you and is troubled by their sexual activity and what they believe is a sinful life, and seeks prayer and support, that should be criminal, because. Jane Ozan believes that you're uh, trying to maliciously hurt that person by praying for them. Now, never mind, that's contrary to Christian doctrine. Never mind, it's contrary to Lambeth 110, the article that the liberals love to cite, which affirms the value and validity of conversion prayer and therapy. Um, and never, and she instead wants to control your thoughts and minds. We've moved far past, far past allowing each side to live and let live. And we're currently in the, you must do what we say. And now she wants to add to that, you must think what we want you to think. Yeah, it's it's the thought police, it's the prayer police. It's, it's strange. Now, George and I agree that the topic of sexual orientation and sexuality and lust 
and all that's behind it is a difficult topic. We both know people who have paid, prayed for uh, conversion from uh, their sexual orientation and have been delivered. We know people who prayed for it and have not been delivered. It's a tough topic. Absolutely. No question about it. The question is, now, are we allowed to pray for it? And according to Jane Ozan, no. Conversion within the church based on sexual orientation must be denied and made criminal, as Canada just did. There's an open letter that's circulating in England signed by a thousand, over a thousand Christian leaders, uh, including two members of the Archbishop's Council, one of whom is Ian Paul. He's uh, well known on the England Anglican circles as a writer. We're saying that uh, the government's, if the government, we will have to violate this law and the government's going to turn us into criminals because our faith teaches us that we must pray for these people, any people. So I don't think the government is going to go that far because the pushback is coming. But see, Canada is a different story. Canada doesn't have as strong a uh, intellectual religious uh, group, lobby group worldview that allows it to fight back against the latest, latest kookiness. Canada is the place where a, a father was uh, jailed for protesting his daughter's, uh, teenage daughter's transgender desires. Um, Canada is not the United States by any means. Well, we have a great example. In Canada, a bishop sued a blogger and won. Okay, that's how bad Canada is. And you're, and you're right. Uh, there's no way in Canada to, to put up a religious fight to anything happening there. And in many times, religion in Canada is leading the cultural charge into to, to evil. It's, 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 Canada is trying to catch up with how bad the church is. So. Well, there, are, there is hope in Canada. There are bright spots, the mm -hmm. Anglican uh, network in Canada. I've been saying Anik all these years, and friends tell me that's wrong. It's Anik. Anik and other like-minded groups are trying to win the country for Christ and restore the moral and uh, ethical fiber of the nation. Mm -hmm. They're having a tough time because the government and the, and the uh, elite culture are dead sent against them and are trying to stamp them out using every tool the state has. Yeah, it's, including it's, censorship of thought, censorship of language, uh, and so. and prison. There are yeah. there are Christian ministers in prison because they fought COVID, or because they fought the gender wars, and so yep. And let's go back now to that con other Kentucky congressman with the family <laughs> with guns. The guns do not glorify violence, Justin. They are a symbol of freedom that you cannot tell me what to think at any time. There's my independence from your uh, attempts to be my master and lord. Mm -hmm. My master and lord is Jesus Christ, not Justin Welby, not the elite of the New York Times editorial board. Uh, the Church of England and, and Britain in particular are examples of what America said no to. Okay, the pilgrims came over and fled the, the um, judgmental at the time and still... Church of England and came here to America to to have free worship um, and not be told how to worship. Good job. And America is founded on those principles of frontiers and where um, there's a place I can go that has more freedom than I'm experiencing in, in this country. And all around the globe, people have come and fought and risked their lives and their livelihood to come to America. Is it the greatest place on earth? Well, yeah, it kind of is. Uh, is it perfect? No, it's far from perfect because it's a melting pot of everybody from around the world who came here seeking freedom. And the people who came here understand, from all around the world, understand freedom differently. Some people came here as slaves, and they certainly understand it differently. Some people came here um, you know, to get away from famine and, and economic, not just persecution in the country. And they understand freedom differently. And America is that melting pot right near, now, trying to rediscover all the time what that freedom means. And for some of us, uh, self-defense and protection and what guns symbolize is not violence, but it's that, that same uh, 
thing of hopping on a ship and, and uh, racing out of England to be safe here in America. So, One of the things that uh, people who don't know the American history or culture, for instance, is that African Americans for a long time were some of the greatest pro proponents of gun rights. Mm -hmm. Because in the Jim, Jim Crow South and in the segregation area, when the state and the culture was against you, sometimes violently, you still had a gun and you could defend yourself. And during the Civil Rights era, uh, Martin Luther King may have marched down the street uh, leading the parade, but there were members of that crowd who had guns, and if the Ku Klux Klan were going to turn on them with their guns, they could fight back. Mm -hmm. And part and there's that unspoken understanding that you just can't do certain things <clears throat> the way you can in other places. Now, and we look at what happened. You go to San Francisco, you go to Chicago, you go to New York, where we now have these. You go to parts of Los Angeles where they have these flash mobs and gangs robbing stores in the nicest parts of the town city. That's not happening in Houston. That's not happening in Florida. Miami. No, there's nothing here in Florida. <laughs> And the reason why is that you are more likely than not to have come across a gun, a shop owner who has a shotgun under his uh, mm -hmm. uh, counter, whereas that's forbidden in San Francisco. It's I'm here in RV Central in, in Webster, Florida, and I would say at least 90% of the RVs here have at least a handgun. Um, it's just the way people feel more protective when they do their travels. Uh, do they spend time in New Jersey? Not really. No, no, no. They, 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 you don't want to go where you're not wanted, but uh, New Jersey has very tough gun laws, and uh, if you violate them, they put you in prison for a long time for no good reason. Um, enough gun stuff, George. Let's move on to some better topic. This is the story of the week. We have a new feature. We have good news story at the first. We're going to end our, our show with the story of the week. The story of the week here is South Carolina uh, reappears between, uh, between before the uh, South Carolina Supreme Court. And this has been a case that's been going on for uh, a long time. Uh, I can't even you know, eight years? Who knows? Decade? Ten. Maybe longer. Ten years. Ten, Ten years. years. 10 years and so we need to talk about it we kind of need to bring the audience up to speed here um the diocese of south carolina used to be part of the episcopal church the episcopal church um back in the heyday uh the diocese of south carolina was a very vibrant part of the episcopal church it was led by great bishops throughout the the seasons of of the 19th century and 20th century in the episcopal church however when the Episcopal Church kind of went off course, uh, the diocese wanted to say no. And they didn't want to leave. Their current bishop uh, said, I'm not leaving, and I'm not going to take the diocese out of the Episcopal Church. We'll have to be forced out. Well, guess what happened? And eventually, the diocese of South Carolina was forced out of the Episcopal Church. What do we do with the property? We're leaving the Episcopal Church. Our state has neutral principles which says that each church belongs to the people who found it and made it and paid for it. Based on that type of uh, law found in the U.S. Constitution, can we take our churches with us? Thus comes lawsuits, because the Episcopal Church knows that there's value in those churches, and they want to fight for the ownership of those churches. And the ownership of the diocesan name and the ownership of the diocesan seal in those assets. And so we find ourselves going to court, which has happened many times in the last 20 years in the Episcopal Church, over the assets of churches that want to leave. Enter the Dennis Canon. <laughs> the Dennis Canon says, you own your church property unless you want to leave. Because the Dennis Canon says, you are turning over your, in trust to the Episcopal Church the ownership of your property is left in trust to the Episcopal Church. It's not a well-written law, not a well-written rule. It's debated whether or not the Dennis Canon was officially uh, accepted as a uh, rule or bylaw within the church. And it's led to lots of money being spent on uh, legal fighting over property rights in the Episcopal Church, the amount of 100 million, 120 million, it's a lot. 
So George and I are going to talk a little bit about uh, the diocese Anglican and the diocese wannabe Episcopal fighting over property in and before the Supreme Court because it's a two-part story. The Supreme Court in a five uh, decision, separate decision, said, well, clearly the Episcopal Church has a good case here. Let's send it back to the appeals court. <laughs> well, these five decisions are so chaotic that, well, we, we kind of want a majority of the judges to tell us what, what's really going on here. And there was no majority decision from the U.S. Supreme Court, the last, the uh, uh, South Carolina Supreme Court. South Carolina Supreme Court. Last time through. Well, let's try it again. And here we are trying it again. And this is this is law. This is legal. It may look really, really good for one side. But in the end, it's all what happens with uh, what happens behind the court doors, George, when the judges sit down and, and, and write their opinions. And we have expert A.S. Haley, who posted a story that we put it on Anglican Inc. yesterday. And let's talk about the latest developments from the Diocese of South Carolina, George. Okay, I, I need to preface this by saying that uh, 20 we, years ago, yeah, I served as an expert witness uh, for Chuck Murphy and All Saints Waccamaw in the original case. Ten years ago, I well, hold on, okay, uh, current route. Hold, Chuck Murphy won that case. The diocese, uh, the <clears throat> U, the Supreme Court of South Carolina says the Dennis Cannon cannot be applied here because of neutral principles. That case that you were an expert witness in was won by Chuck Murphy. Yeah, I, and all I did was testify as to the history of the canon law in the Episcopal Church. And then I was an expert witness early on. I never, never participated in trial or anything, but I was engaged by the Diocese of South Carolina, and I investigated the history of the Dennis Canon. So I have had uh, some... Uh, uh, Stop it, boy. <laughs> I have had interactions. I've been, I have received money for my services. Money you know, for your services, so but was, you did research on the Dennis Cannon. Were you ever able to determine whether the Dennis Cannon was officially passed as a bylaw of the Episcopal Church? No, it wasn't passed as a bylaw of the Episcopal Church. It's assumed to have passed. Okay. But there is no evidence that it was passed. And I document. But I document this in great detail in a report that you can find it on the internet in places. Mm -hmm. But the uh, and, but now then there comes the legal argument. Okay, if these are the facts that George Conger has been able to demonstrate, and these are the procedures that took place and didn't take place. What does that mean legally? That's not something I address. I right. just I just did the work, went into the archives, uh, did the research, and. And there's no evidence that it passed. Uh, however, so the the the, the however, court the court in the diocese of uh, South Carolina is not talking about whether or not it was passed. Right, there were okay. way 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 past. There that's, were ten that's, years. Yeah, yeah. And so the the last time the Supreme Court of South Carolina did not issue a majority decision that was actually workable. Mm -hmm. five justices came up with five opinions and which five is controlling but there was no opinion that overturned the original Waccamaw All Saints case which is the Dennis Cannon's no good in the Diocese of South Carolina so this has was sent back to the uh, district courts well how do we enforce five separate opinions and a ju judge Dixon of the uh, lower courts basically said you know we need proof that these parishes agreed to uh, subordinate their rights to the national church, not just the assertion that they had, which the Episcopal Church nationally had made. And so essentially the those parishes who wanted to leave were allowed to leave and keep their property. Now it's gone back up to the Supreme Court again in South Carolina. and. Alan Haley is essentially saying it looks like they'll be able to keep their property, but they may lose the comp the Christ Camp Christopher, which is the church's diocesan camp. Um, but again, that's 
he's he Alan is pretty confident that the Dutch the justices admitted they screwed up last time, and they're going to basically uh, try to f settle this once and for all. And it looks like, just looks like, and nobody can read the minds of you these can't. judges. You can't. It looks like the case has been made, and the Anglican Diocese of South Carolina and the Episcopal Diocese of South Carolina will go their separate ways. And each with the property that they want and have already in their hands. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's, it's unlikely that we'll see a Fort Worth scenario where one side takes all. Um, because that wasn't the battle in South Carolina. No, and, but that's one of the interesting things is you and I have seen these court trials go throughout the whole nation. California, Illinois, um, uh, Washington, Oregon. I can, I can just name them, name them, name them. And just, we, oh, that was a great case. Our lawyer did wonderful. And, you know, prognosticators and uh, others would sit there and say, you know, it looks like the Episcopal Church is going to lose. And we'd have so much hope. And then came the decision, which, like the, the South Carolina one uh, from the Supreme Court's last time, was just crazy and un uncomprehensible. I don't want to give you hope that you're going to win Anglican Diocese of South Carolina, but it looks good, George. Yeah, uh, I've I've served as an expert witness in cases in California, Tennessee, New York, mm -hmm. Pennsylvania, South Carolina. We mentioned not all of them, but I've served in a good number of these fights. Again, as a fact witness, again as a history expert on the canon laws and the, their development and what the church thought and when. And what I've come away from all this is that that really doesn't matter. Yeah. It's really what the judges uh, want to do and how they respond to. So an argument that, say, in the California courts, which are very liberal, and they t they look, they don't, my experience is that the judges don't look at the actual evidence and law. They look at what is popular. So when you have a group in California that is saying, uh, well, these are homophobes and they shouldn't be allowed to keep their property. The judge is more inclined to say, yeah, we don't want that as make, a public that makes good sense. Yeah. them to win. Yeah. But in uh, other places, the judges may say, well, that's not an issue I need to look at. Yeah. So we, it, for example, Texas. In Texas, that wouldn't have been an, an issue. So the quality of the judiciary has been very uneven across the United States, as has been the quality of the legal help. Mm -hmm. Some dioceses have had fantastic lawyers. Others have had, you know, Pittsburgh lost because of a legal mistake, not because of the facts. Yeah. Originally, Bob Duncan, you know, lost not because he was wrong, but because his lawyers screwed up. Um, so, well, but in the same respect, Texas, Diocese of Fort Worth, the opponents lost everything because the lawyers said it's all or nothing when they could have yeah, early the on Episcopal negotiated. Church's lawyers, yeah. Episcopal Church's lawyers screwed up in Texas. Yeah. So, so I, I Paul's, Paul's, uh, the Apostle Paul's words, don't go to court with the Gentiles to fight these disputes out, really makes sense because nobody's really won in any of this. Imagine if there were a hundred million dollars invested in new churches and evangelism for the past decade. How would the church be different today? How would the church be different today if the newspapers were not covering the fight? If all people got to read about was people having a war over um, this and that within the church. Uh, There's a, what, a little... What, go ahead. I, I just want to slide in a little story that we published. We published a, a guest news item from a, a fellow in Alabama mm -hmm. where the Cathedral of the Advent, which had been the stalwart against the liberal tide in Alabama, uh, held a, allowed, the, allowed the diocesan ordinations to take place. And one of the people ordained was a non-celibate, I uh, believe, a lesbian. And in the past, the cathedral would not have gone along with that. Now the new cathedral, because they lost their dean and have basically agreed to go along to get along with the Diocese of Alabama, is allowing that to take place. And some people are up in arms, saying, oh my, the cathedral has just lost it all. While others are saying, look, in the circumstances that we're living in, we, we need to 
basically give a little to get a little. Uh, if we need to have these services where the bishop comes and does things we don't agree with, well, we can hold our breath, but then she's gone and we're back to ourselves. Now, is that the right way forward? I don't know. Uh, well, I those do. Those who, 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 do, who demand absolute purity, no, it's not. But for those who, do, who seek continuity of worship, it is. So what's the way forward? I don't know, because we're supposed to love our enemy. And I remember talking to some senior people in the Diocese of Albany right before Catherine Jeffrey Shoy was going to make her trip to have a visitation of the, of the diocese. And, oh, man, <laughs> there was talk about, well, what do we, you well, she better not come to my church. <laughs> and I, I just remember, you know, Bishop Love being so very collegial, very loving, uh, uh, you know, and yes, they had Catherine Jeffrey Shorey, an enemy to their cause, come and visit their diocese. So, yeah, well, we, but, we in, had, but in, the, in the long run, did that help Albany? No, but okay. in the short run, it didn't hurt Albany. Okay. Uh, we had Catherine Jeffrey Shorey come to the Diocese of Central Florida only once during her time. Hmm. And I had a head cold that time that she came. What, what would it have served, purpose would it have served to have uh, embarrassed her, to have basically embarrassed the bishop who is supposed to have the presiding bishop visit at least once mm -hmm. during their tenure. If that's the ditch he wants to die in, I don't think that's a very wise ditch. Uh, can he basically hold that off while you allow your little George Congers on the ground to make make disciples for Jesus Christ? It's the, it's the, it's not a black and white world sometimes. Sometimes. No, I, I agree. Okay, George, that is a whole hour show. What do we got here? Uh, is it still working? One hour and two minutes. You guys are the most patient audience in all of Christendom. I want to thank you for watching. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger, and you've been watching episode 705 of Anglican Unscripted.